The first order of business that we have is a special agenda um, item, and that's a spe special presentation from Dick Meyer regarding the Interchange Angels program that um, he has developed, and he just wants to bring us up to date on that. And uh, Mr. Mayor, we appreciate all your work up to this point, and we look forward to uh, hearing what you got to say. If you would, just come forward. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, meet with you and kind of give you an update on where we are in the uh, litter control program. Uh, you've heard the expression, you bit off more than you can chew. Sometimes I think it applies to what, I, what I'm doing here. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I went to the county commissioners and shared with them my observation that we had a littering problem in the county. And they agreed. And I don't think anybody would, wouldn't agree that there's a littering problem. The question is, what do we do about it? And so I uh, made a presentation to them, and I suggested a plan uh, whereby we could address the litter program, uh, the litter problem, rather. My program had three components. Uh, I shown you this before, but I'm doing this by way of a quick review. On the left, we have education and community engagement. Then we have anti-littering enforcement and cleanup response. Those are the three pillars of the county's litter control program. As I made my presentation to the commissioners, they liked what I said evidently because they said, you like it, you're doing it so well, why don't you do this? Why don't you take it on as a project? And uh, I said, well, I really don't think I'm, I'm the person for that. And they disagreed, and the mm -hmm. bottom line was, here I am. I'm the county's volunteer litter control coordinator. Emphasis on the volunteer. Uh, the program's three pillars, education and community engagement, trying to get the community more aware of the littering problem and involved in responding to that problem. Anti-littering enforcement, attempting to get uh, the county sheriffs, town police, and the state highway patrol more engaged and more involved in enforcing the litter laws. And then ultimately the cleanup response, uh, trying to clean the highways of roadside <coughs> litter. So far, uh, we've implemented the plan. Uh, I made a number of littering has consequences presentations to community, civic, and religious groups. The handout that I gave you, this little brochure, is one that I have developed and I'm distributing throughout the county, throughout the town and the county. Again, just to get people more involved and more aware of the consequences of littering. It's more than just throwing something out the window. It's damaging the environment. It's damaging the habitat for wildlife and we, we ought to be aware of it. Uh, I've met with town, county, and state law enforcement. Uh, I have to tell you that my efforts in that regard have not been terribly productive. Uh, law enforcement does not view this as a high priority, and they have other, other priorities, understandably so, and limited resources, and so I don't think we're gonna be able to do much with respect to increased enforcement. I coordinated with Region 1 of the State Highway uh, Department and informed them of what we're doing, and I attempt to coordinate our work with everything that they're doing. Uh, as I said, uh, I don't think we're going to see much in the way of increased enforcement. So we're going to have to focus on education and community engagement and cleanup response. 
The fact is that a lot of people still view uh, the public uh, roads as their personal trash bins, and that's not acceptable. As you look at the problem, uh, the five U.S. Route 17 Edenton interchanges seem to be the worst uh, in terms of uh, roadside littering. Uh, as I said, I've made several presentations. Uh, we've increased participation in the Adopt a Highway program. When I started this effort, there were nine organizations that were involved in the Adopt a Highway program. There are now 21. So we've got more people involved, more organizations involved. And I'm still pushing that to get more, uh, to more organizations involved. I started a litter control Facebook page, uh, and we privatized the county litter control effort. When I made my pitch to the county commissioners, I said to them, I just want you to support this for a year. At the end of the year, we'll privatize it. And that's what I've done. I've started a, a private organization called Clean Chowan County, uh, and it's going to be a not-for-profit as we proceed. The mistake I made was I made it an LLC, not realizing an LLC can't be a not-for-profit. So I've got to reincorporate and continue that work. And then ultimately, I've developed a new program, which is why we're here tonight for Littering Hotspots. Uh, and it's called the Interchange Angels Program. Uh, the goal of the program is to enhance the appearance of, of the county and our town uh, for people who are visiting us and who live here by cleaning up the littering hotspots along approaches to Edenton on Route 17. Uh, we've designated 10 uh, of the U.S. Route 17 interchange sites as littering hotspots. There are five interchanges. We've divided them in half to give us 10 sites. And our plan is to clean those sites immediately before county and town events that attract a lot of people to our community so that our town and our county shines when they get here. Things like uh, the fair, uh, the, uh, uh, the pilgrimage, uh, uh, we have something called easels in the garden in April. So just before those events, we want to get these groups that are part of the Interchange Angels program mobilized to go out and clean up those interchanges so that when people come, they see Edenton as an attractive place uh, to visit. Uh, I want to go through the sites with you very quickly. Uh, here they are. This is... Uh, Exit 230 along Route 17. Uh, the first exit is you're coming uh, west uh, or south. Site 1, uh, both ramps uh, west of exit 230. Site 2, both ramps east of exit 230. The Open Door Church has adopted that whole thing. They are the interchange angels for those two sites. I'm very, very happy to say that. Uh, sites three and four are along Paradise Road, exit 228. Uh, site three, the ramps on the south side of uh, 17, and site four on the north side. Uh, then you get to uh, Route 32. I have designated that area as Burger Junction. Uh, <laughs> because of all of the past uh, Site five are the ramps to the right. Uh, site six, the ramps to the left. We don't have anybody covering those yet. Then we have exit 226, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, and you see site seven and eight, one on the north side, one on the south side. Then exit 224, and I'm, I'm very happy to report that the, both of these sites have been adopted. Uh, the Edenton's Lion, Edenton Lions Club is doing yeoman's work, great work, on Site 10, uh, which is uh, which are the two, two ramps uh, toward the river, uh, <coughs> west or south of uh, Queen Street. And they were out there the last time we had a cleanup. 
uh, with a, oh, I must have had eight, ten people out there working hard to clean up that, uh, that site. Uh, as you look at the picture, uh, we, to the left you see site, that box that says site 10, and you see two yellow arrows. The top arrow points to the ramp that heads off of Queen Street onto the, toward the bridge. That, I think, is the worst site in the county. There is uh, evidently uh, a group of people there that live somewhere up just outside of the picture that view that as their personal dump site. And uh, my wife and I have been out there a couple times picking up trash because it's so bad. We picked up bags of baby diapers and uh, just per, you know household trash that people are just dumping out there with impunity. And I told the uh, sheriff's office about it, and they they said they'll see what they can do on the highway uh, highway patrol also. But so far they haven't caught anybody. And then site nine, which is to the right. Uh, we have Edenton Lake and Harbor community has adopted that site. And so of the total 10 sites, we have uh, six of, uh, four of them that have been adopted. I need six more organizations to volunteer to adopt a site. And I'm out there working hard to try to find somebody that would be interested in adopting one of those sites and in the process become an interchange angel. Uh, the concept of operations, as they say, recruit people to adopt uh, one of the sites. And when they do, I give them uh, high visibility vests, I give them trash grabbers, I give them rubber gloves, trash bags, uh, which until recently was all coming out of my pocket, but we, we have had some contributions, so we now have people who are funding that. And then we conduct four to six cleanups, each prior to a major tourist attracting event. And as we do that, I coordinate with the uh, uh, Department of Transportation to have the collected bags picked up. Uh, as I've indicated, we have three groups who have signed up to, to clean up four sites, and we need six more. Uh, this is the action schedule for 2024. February 24th, we're going to have a winter cleanup. April 20th, we'll have another one before easels in the garden, which corresponds to the Department of Transportation litter sweep uh, program. Then we'll have one on June 1st before the Major League Bass Fishing Tournament. We'll have another one on August 24th before Labor Day, one before the Regional Fair, and then another one on December 7th uh, before the Christmas Candlelight Tour. We may insert another uh, date in there, or we may change one of these depending upon what happens. That, in the nutshell, is the Angels uh, program. Uh, it's one that's unique. There's not another one like it in the country. And I think it's one that could really make a difference in our community. So if any of you know a social group, civic group, community group, religious group, that might be interested in adopting one of those sites, please let me know, because I'd like to work with them. Yes, sir, Craig. As a member of the Eaton Lions Club, I would like to uh, formally challenge the Eaton Rotary Club to uh, pick out a site to give you a hand. <laughs> so I know we have a couple members from the Eaton Rotary Club here. Maybe they would consider joining us. Challenge noted. Okay. Great, thank you. Mr. Mayor, no questions. I just want to commend you on uh, your generous giving of your time and efforts to address this issue. And, Thank you, Mr. Uh, we Mayor. appreciate hearing uh, hearing from you further. But uh, everything you're doing is most appreciated. Thank you. So, Any other questions? I have one, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to make sure that the public understands a little bit better, what what are the criteria for adoption? Is there a cost associated with that? Is there just a letter of commitment. There's, there's the no date. cost associated with it. If they tell me they're interested, I'll come meet with them and explain the program to them. Uh, if they if they agree, and we we like to have at least six people in a, in a group that would do this uh, for one of those sites. A bigger site like the Lions Club has uh, it's a pretty big site, and they have a lot of people out there. But at least six. We had eight. 
That, yeah, eight, we had eight and four, four on each side, and it took us about an hour, hour and a half to get everything done. There's no cost to anybody who participates. In fact, I give them equipment. I give them the vests, the grabbers, the gloves, the bags, and, and they keep them. I mean, I'm not, it's not a lead situation. They keep them. Uh, and then they use them every time they go out and do the cleanup work. So uh, it's, a, it's a great community service, and it's something I'd like to see more people uh, get involved in. Any more questions? Thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. I hope that I come back to you next year and we'll have some real progress to report. We look forward to it. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. The next uh, order of business, uh, we move from our special meeting to our committee meetings, and the first committee meeting is the administrative committee chaired by Councilman Miller. And Councilman Miller, before you begin, I'd just like to make a brief comment on uh, the first item that you're going to report on, and that's the proposed uh, change to our rules of procedure. Um, at the January meeting, I asked um, Corey Gooden, our town manager, to place a new agenda item on our agenda for that meeting um, entitled the manager's report. And I felt like the manager's report would give our manager the opportunity to uh, respond to items that may have been brought up in public comment at previous meetings and also to respond and report on items that uh, were brought up by town councilman at um, the agenda item section entitled uh, items considered timely and important. I uh, felt like it would be a, a good opportunity for us to stay on top of things and maybe have less things uh, slip through the cracks and also an opportunity to just have greater transparency for our citizens. Um, so I would ask um, that you guys uh, consider that recommendation um, and since I was the one who brought it up, I, I wanted to make those prelim preliminary comments and would just ask that perhaps you send it on to a full vote uh, in uh, February. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Me, uh, still, still a little That's bit That's okay. Uh, Mayor, we have, the Administrative Committee has two um, uh, items of business. Uh, the first, uh, under the Council's Rules and Procedure document, the addition of a Town Manager Report agenda item. Uh, Mayor, in, in a concerted effort to create and furnish a mechanism by which the town manager can provide us all with planned updates from comments and questions voiced by both the public and council members from the previous council meeting, uh, the administrative committee suggests council consider adopting a manager's report agenda item to be added to the order of business section of the rules and procedure document. Uh, the administrative committee recommends this, uh, this council meeting agenda item addition be submitted to full council at our February 12th uh, meeting. Appreciate it. Any comments on that? It does. I, I got a question. Yeah. Um, Corey, how does that work from your perspective? Should that be an issue for you to get together or? No, and so <clears throat> for me, it'd just be a matter of, of looking back at the previous notes that I had and any of the video recordings and try to grab anything from public comment or um, timely and important and try to uh, pull something together. Um, most of the items are generally addressed in the weekly manager's report that I send out. Um, so summarizing those should be fairly quickly unless there's a contentious <laughs> issue. I just wanted to make sure we weren't giving you even even more than we already do. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, the second item um, is the Town of Edenton recording policy. Uh, in regards to the uh, video recording of town employees, town staff have drafted a new employee policy to address the growing trend of First Amendment audits and video encounters between the public sector and town employees. At this time, the town does not have a written policy in place to instruct uh, how our employees should respond when a video recording incident arises. Town staff will continue to inquire with similar municipalities to see if additional language needs to be added to the town's final draft of the recording policy. Administrative committee recommends forwarding this new uh, town recording policy to full council at February 12th meeting. 
And Corey, if that is passed, will there be a training element where the employees are trained on um, how to handle those type of situations? There will. So our <coughs> team has been working um, with Tyler to try to pull together some dates and um, programs that offer training specifically on this with the league and some of the PIO um, groups that are out there within the state and we plan on doing some type of lunch and learn after uh, this policy is put in place. One, to introduce the policy to all the staff but also to go through some of the interactions and some of the bad examples that we found on things that have gone wrong and we just want to make sure that um, they get that chance to have some exposure to that. Um, so yes, we will, I would say, hopefully by the end of February, if not beginning of March, we'll have something scheduled. It's just taking a little bit of time to find someone to teach on this because it is such an emerging topic. This, you know, started off small and it's getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Are, so we're are you currently reviewing uh, policies from other loca locales? Okay. Yes, and we've, we've been doing that um, up until this point with the draft that was shared in the agenda packet. Um, that was a first draft and then we actually found some additional items that were included um, just as of Friday. So uh, getting the policy in place and then letting it being a living document as we move forward, it may come back to council at some point in the, in the near future or it may be something that we do an annual review on to make sure we're maintaining status quo. That's all the administrative committee has, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Miller. Um, we next move to the Public Works Committee, which is chaired by Councilman Coston. Councilman Coston? Or are you taking the first thing or what? Um, either way, I can, I can chime in or take lead on it. Okay. You can go and take the first one. All right, so one of the items that we have is the no, uh, no truck traffic vehicle weight restrictions. Um, we have been reviewing details regarding the designing and implementation of this for the old Hereford Road um, area. Uh, we want to make sure that some of the majority of the concerns that we've received, just so the general public knows, is, is overall related to the narrow, narrow, narrowness of the roadway, some of the recent roadway drainage improvements that we made for stormwater infrastructure as well as some of the shoulder improvements along the residential areas. We've also received some concerns around local re from local residents about the public safety of you know, children or people who may um, you know, be playing in the yards with some of the larger trucks. And really that's what we're, we're really trying to shoot for here is to, um, to limit that to, to some regards. Uh, the town staff, which include the police department and public works, we've been working with the surrounding municipalities and the North Carolina Highway Patrol to determine what the specific requirements are for this type of traffic change. I did include a map in the agenda packet for council to see which areas we're talking about from North Broad Street down to Church Street. Um, at least initial restrictions are looking like it would be 38,000 pounds for vehicle traffic. That may change. Um, what we're recommending tonight is that the Public Works Committee consider this type of traffic change for the area with the main contingency being that the final weight restriction would be determined at the February 12th meeting. We're still waiting to get some of that back from the NCDOT enforcer guys. Um, but I do want to kind of make a note here. There are certain exceptions that we've looked into that pertain to this law when we talk about municipal use, when we talk about farming use, these type of um, vehicles will still be allowed to travel these roads. What we're really trying to um, implement here is to work towards some of your commercial, industrial, and passer through traffic that are using these mainly residential areas as kind of a shortcut or a cut through, um, maybe from our industrial park or from NC-17 um, where they're coming in off of North Broad at the north end. Um, and so really the goal for us is, is to, to try to alleviate some of that passer through traffic um, but um, I think we've had some questions, and Tyler's not here tonight, but we're going to try to inform the public also on what some of the additional exceptions will be um, for the use of this space. But really, it's geared towards those long-haul freights, folks who are just really trying to avoid town and avoid the stoplights, and they can get to 32 or 37 quickly by, you know, 
using this old Hertford Road. And it's, it's really narrow. It's really too narrow for two trucks to be passing, but we don't want to limit use if, um, you know, if our local residents are um, using, utilizing that for any type of, you know, farming need or business needs. Um, but hopefully we'll have something out for the public that will show the weight restrictions, any of the axle limits that we have. Um, we're also going to reach out to some of our industrial partners to let them know what we're looking at doing. Um, but at least initially we would like to, to start Good. with the no, no truck traffic uh, limitation <laughs> on that street. And then as it evolves, we will uh, bring that back to council on the 12th. So and I'm sorry, you go ahead. <clears throat> So, so what you're talking about primarily are 18 wheelers. Yes. But uh, I see Mr. Parrish in here. But for, for like farmers with these big trucks, that they're getting their stuff out of their fields and stuff, yep. they're, they're still going to be able yep. to get into. Okay. Yeah. And so we went through some of the general statutes to see what those exceptions were, and there's a long list in there that that are not applicable to the axle limits and the weight limits based on the type of business. Um, and agriculture was one of those. Okay. And you told the CYK. Uh, not we recently. The, okay. But, uh, can I say one quick thing? Sure. I uh, commend you for the agriculture exemption, but I just got a question. If you don't want them going down there, and I'm not saying that's not a bad idea because it is a narrow road, it's kids in the road a lot of times, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. But how do you, how do you want them to go around there? You're talking about Well, one of the things we're considering is trying to help funnel some of our truck traffic towards Coke Avenue, um, mm -hmm. where we have a lot bigger roadway, and we're trying to work with our industrial partners to kind of get into that routine, not to completely bypass Old Hereford, but to use Coke Avenue to get back around to 37, and basically, instead of going back north, how half a mile to get on Old Hereford, they go half a mile to Coke Avenue and use that. And we're also trying to have some of those discussions with DOT about the Broad Street pieces to utilize Virginia Road, Paradise, and Coke Avenue to get you to that 37 route okay. versus one, those. One thing that we have to consider was for DOT, but in Colony Tire, if you got to make a left turn with an 18 wheeler, or if you're coming from Paradise and taking a right on Coke Avenue, I'll take you in a truck sometime, and you can't make that turn without somebody moving over or So right now, which way do you guys take when you're coming from? <laughs> so you'll you'll make that left onto Broad Street, then make a right onto Old Hereford Road. You're passing. Uh, if, if we come, if we're trying to turn on the Coke Avenue, if we're coming that way, you can make the turn. You just got to swing way out into the on right. lane, and you got to hope nobody's in the left turning lane coming off of uh, Coke Avenue. Okay. Right. Then you can make, but it's just a really tight turn for it. So if someone Googles directions to a certain area, does it take them down that route or for a truck? No, I, I, um, the, uh, it depends on which way they're coming from. But okay. um, if we looked on shortest distance, which is what we found out for the GPS units, it's very likely that it would just funnel folks up to Cocab, uh, Old Hartford Road. Uh -huh. And that would be 
part of the conversation with us with DOT when we talk about the GPS updates and we also talk about the Coke <laughs> Avenue intersection improvements that are needed to allow for that. That would be um, two things that have to be considered. So when you make a change like this, when a municipality makes a change like this, um, DOT is notified and there's some process where the GPS companies are notified also. Yes. Any more uh, on that? Okay. Carry on. I'm going to start with uh, line item number four, which is the Terry Avenue and Robin Lane intersection. Uh, so sometime early summer, uh, it was brought to the town's attention that uh, some excessive speeding was occurring on Terry Avenue. So it was determined by the Public Works Department that we would implement a uh, temporary speed hump. Uh, since the implementation, uh, we've received concerns from the residents uh, in the Oak Hill and Morgan Park neighborhood. Um, of expressing some concerns about the uh, speed hump. So since then, um, the Public Works Department as well as the town administration has been assessing the area and has determined uh, that we no longer would need that speed hump at that intersection of Terry Avenue and Robin Lane. So uh, it is a recommendation of the Public Works Dep uh, Committee that we will uh, remove that uh, speed hump. And so we send that up to full council for uh, consideration. Um, Next, we're going to start with the Granville Street and West Albemarle and Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue intersection. Over the past couple years, um, there have been complaints of excessive speeding up and down Granville Street, as well as several collisions at that particular intersection. Um, the town has uh, made several efforts to help combat that by reducing the speed from 35 to 25 throughout the entire uh, distance of Granville Street, as well as implementing a flashing stop sign uh, facing Dr. Martin Luther King Avenue. Uh, since doing so, it has shown very little success. Uh, so both the Public Works Department as well as the Town Administration has partnered with DOT to figure out uh, the best practice to implement uh, to help reduce both the uh, amount of collisions as well as excessive speeding. So it's been determined that um, we should implement a four-way stop sign at that intersection. Uh, so it is recommended that we do move that to full council with uh, the contingency of three things. One being that we perform a DOT uh, study, uh, traffic study uh, from the intersection, from that intersection to the Granville Street and Queen Street intersection to ensure there's no congestion. Also to ensure that we adopt some type of uh, routine uh, canopy pruning uh, to make sure that we have a, a proper uh, visibility of the existing stop sign as well as the flashing lights that are current there, currently there now. And then uh, also to allow at least a 30 day window of educating the public on uh, that new uh, implementation of uh, the stop signs. Uh, so it's recommended that we do move that on. Right. To full uh, can I have a question? Sure. If you're not stopping at the two stop signs that are there now, what's going to make them stop at full stop signs? No, I'm, I'm just I'm just asking a question. If you're having wrecks and and all this stuff when you got two stop signs and one got a red light going all around, you tell it to stop. Well. Uh, what can make them stop at the full stop sign? So um, for us, one of the things that we looked at from the staffing's perspective when we reviewed um, most of the incidents we've had there is that most of the victims of um, the collisions have been on your north to southbound Granville traffic. Mm -hmm. um, and the intent uh, behind that is the individuals traveling, you know, down Granville Street, um, you know, with with nothing more than a caution light, they approach you know multiple intersections before the um, Albemarle and MLK intersection, as well as um, as they approach the one for Queen Street. Um, you know, there's about eight intersections that are passed. Um, this is the only one that that individual traveling north or south is finding its way as the victim. Um, to the collision. Um, so the idea behind this after having some discussions with the folks from NCDOT is that 
Um, this will give that, that traveler on Granville Street that time to pause, to basically look both ways before they proceed, um, and thus removing them from that blindsided impact. Um, that was also the case when we had a um, public works employee struck on a 72 inch bright orange lawnmower traveling five miles an hour and they were still hit luckily at the rear of the vehicle as they proceeded through that intersection so the intent is to create that additional time you know a second or two to allow that vehicle to stop look and then travel to make sure that the car approaching them from the east west streets um, are not coming into collision and that was the one suggestion that we had found um, for this particular intersection now i've got a question uh, have we uh, gone out there since we started addressing this issue and uh, cut back any of the foliage that is uh, blocking the visibility as you're coming up? Not okay. yet. Um, we're in the right time of year to be doing yeah. that, and we, we have all intentions to start some of that cleanup and to really kind of lift some of those um, um, limbs uh, that affect the canopy and, and kind of just cycle. Mayor? And that seems to be like a fairly ministerial thing. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to wait for us to That's right. discuss and it we'll in February. If we get the time, we'll go ahead and start yep. doing that. Yeah. Mayor? Uh, I, like, I would like to uh, add uh, item D to your list. Uh, we need to have cautionary uh, warning stop signs prior to the lit up stop sign. Maybe, I don't, I don't know how many feet back, just to warn people that they are approaching a, a stop sign. So I think they're not <laughs> stopping all of a sudden. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's sitting there on our MLK now. Um, it's about the same distance, if not closer. Or something. And so, really, one thing when we um, <coughs> when we look at what the impact is from NCDOT, if you think north of this intersection, you have a lot more roadway that is uh, less likely to be impacted by a momentary stop. However. You only have two blocks between Queen Street and MLK, so we really need to work with folks from DOT to make sure <coughs> that stop on such a short roadway between uh, a, a closer stoplight doesn't impact that traffic turning left off of Queen headed north and start to back up that intersection. So that's part of the ask here. Um, and really for us, um, one of the things, in addition to the, the canopy pruning, um, I think it would be wise for the committee to recommend a minimum 30 days for notice if we choose to, to put these stops in. Um, and particularly for us, um, it's very favorable now because we still do not have a paving schedule. Um, <coughs> the DOT on the contractor that's paving Granville Street. Once we get that schedule and can anticipate when they would be here, if we're gonna consider this type of change, um, Knowing their schedule will help us to do the, the press release that we need to educate the public if council chooses to do this, but it will also allow this type of change to happen after the street has been paved, which typically go hand in hand if there's a new traffic pattern or if there's a new change to a road, you would, you would commonly kind of pair those up. And so I think it's the silver lining for us is it does allow us to work with the public a lot more to say, hey, we're considering this hey, we're going to be, you know, seeing what the traffic impact is, but you're also going to have time for residents to, you know, know. Um, I think one of the examples we've looked at is when the four-way stops were added um, in the Hertford community near the high school. There were weeks and weeks of notices out to the general public letting you know that a four-way stop would be coming soon. This is something that we're considering, um, and I think for us, doing that, this would allow us to simply um, make a, a, you know, we could, we could, um, we could table this to uh, a time where we just have the final vote once that information has been given back to us during a um, special meeting or our new business cycle. We make the recommendation and then we get to full council on the 12th. It could be tabled then to mimic that, that paving schedule if you want to wait that way we've got more time to engage the public on that and then do the final vote 
at, at a later date, knowing we have three items, four items now pending that need to be implemented before we you know, consider this. I mean, that is an option for this committee to send it to full council and then table it there. So is the 30-day uh, contingency number three that Councilman Costin mentioned, is that what you mean, 30 days of um, informing the public on Correct. the change to come? Yeah. Right. Least, okay. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's the bare minimum. I think that you probably would want to do that longer when we started this back in on November 27th when this was first introduced. One of the first things um, that was shared um, was the fact that, kind of jokingly, there you may need a, a traffic director there. And I think that the real intent of that is, is you need to make sure folks that are used to that area, that have traveled that area, are going to know that something is new. And so I think for us, the education piece of the rollout date's important. And I would say at least 30 days before we physically make that change, you know, have that out there, if not longer. Yeah. If Any more comments or questions of Corey or? Mm -hmm. Councilman Costin. Okay, thank you, Councilman Costin. Now the final item. So the last item um, is the road diet, Broad Street Road Diet. Uh, back in November, it was presented to us um, by the NCDOT due to the, uh, once again, the excessive speeding on Broad Street and uh, the amount of collisions over the last couple of years. Uh, both Public Works, uh, town administration uh, have been collaborating with uh, the Department of Transportation to identify ways of uh, combating uh, both of those uh, increased speeding and collision. And it was determined uh, that condensing uh, the existing four lanes down to uh, three lanes uh, to uh, one north, one southbound lane, and then one turning lane with two outside bike lanes uh, would be the best practice. But since then, um, on our December 12th meeting, uh, we've revisited that plan and remove the outer bike lanes. Um, so now it'll just be the two uh, lanes with one turn lane in the middle. Um, at that point, I'm sorry, one second. Yes, sorry, <laughs> I had to go back and read it. Um, but yeah, so it's recommended that we go ahead and move that on to full council as well for consideration and further discussion. And that would be without the bike lanes? That would be without the bike lanes, yes. And um, just uh, so the general public knows, on all of these things that um, Councilman Costa just reported on and made recommendations, um, we do have um, public comments scheduled at our regular meetings. And if there are any further comments um, on any of these items that uh, we just discussed, uh, the public will have the opportunity to speak uh, one more time on each of those. Is there any more business, um, Mr. Manager, that you're aware of? No, not at this time. Okay, I'll consider a motion to adjourn. So okay. Second. second. Yeah. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The meeting is closed. Thank you for being here. <coughs>